In February of 1958, a Mark VI atomic bomb was dropped from a B-47 into the yard of a farmhouse in Mars Bluff, South Carolina. Unlike most other nuclear accidents, it couldn't be kept secret and so inspired the New York Times headline, Are We Safe? from our own atomic bombs. It turned out the navigator sent down into the bomb bay to investigate a warning light, then stumbled, accidentally pulled the release and dropped the 8,000 pound nuclear bomb. Target in sight. Why not hell is Major Kong? The story appears to have inspired this classic scene in the film Dr. Strangelove. Now I do think that Stanley Kubrick was aware of this accident because in the film Dr. Strangelove, there's a scene where they're trying to drop a hydrogen bomb and it won't fall out of the plane and one of the, you know, the pilot of the plane jumps on the bomb to try to get the bomb bay doors to open up and then winds up riding the bomb down. Well, in his latest book, Command and Control, investigative journalist Eric Schlosser documents the many near disasters in America's nuclear weapons program and the fearful ongoing possibility of nuclear war. One example in 1980 tells you how the simplest human error almost wiped out the state of Arkansas, along with its young governor, Bill Clinton, and his family. It's known as the Damascus Incident after the small town in the Ozark Mountains where a Titan II missile almost exploded in its silo. Titan II, the largest and the most powerful ballistic missile in our arsenal. The horrific chain of events started when a maintenance man in the silo dropped a metal socket from his wrench and it fell more than 80 feet down the side of the missile before puncturing its fuel tank. Well, Eric Schlosser's new book takes us down that scary road to Damascus. He joined us just a short time ago. Eric Schlosser, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Just how close did we come to losing most of Arkansas and the entire Clinton family? We came pretty close. Uh, there was a major accident involving the most powerful nuclear warhead the United States ever built, and that warhead could have detonated. And if it had detonated, Arkansas would have been consumed in firestorms. Uh, Governor Clinton and his wife Hillary and their baby Chelsea, who was one year old, most likely would have died. And there would have been deadly fallout up the eastern seaboard of the United States. Just give us a sense of how big that warhead was on the, on the Titan II, because it's the biggest yeah. warhead made, pretty much. The warhead was nine megatons, which is the equivalent of nine million tons of TNT. And that one warhead had three times the explosive force of all the bombs used by all the armies in the Second World War combined, including both atomic bombs. Did no one imagine an accident like this happening with a maintenance crew? I mean, clearly the skin of this missile must have been extremely tight under pressure yeah. uh, for a small piece of metal to fall 80 feet and then bounce off the wall and puncture it must have been considered at least. Well, you know, this missile was on alert in 1980 and it had been on alert for about 16 years. Nothing like this had ever happened before. One of the things I look at in the book is how difficult it is to predict accidents in complex technological systems. In that nuclear weapon accident, it was a socket that was accidentally dropped. In another nuclear weapons accident I wrote about, a navigator on a B-52 brought some rubber seat cushions onto the plane, stowed them under the seat, inadvertently near a heat vent. Uh, the seat cushions caught on fire, the plane caught on fire, and it was carrying four hydrogen bombs, and those could have detonated. So again and again you see it's often very trivial things that can lead to potentially catastrophic effects. I've got to ask you very briefly, what happened uh, in the Damascus incident? What was the final result of it? Because I think the, the war well, blew right off the I don't missile. want to give away the ending of the book, but it's yeah. safe to say that the state of Arkansas was not consumed uh, in a firestorm. But there was remarkable heroism by young airmen, young Air Force uh, personnel. And one of the things that my book does is look at how again and again ordinary servicemen risk their lives and sometimes lost them to prevent accidental nuclear detonations in the United States. Well, 1980 was a big year for a potential nuclear catastrophe. Earlier the same year, the president's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, was woken uh, in the middle of the night by a phone call from a staff general who told him that 220 Soviet missiles had been launched from submarines and were on their way in a surprise attack on the United States. What happened next? And Brzezinski was the national security advisor to President Carter, and he told his uh, 
military aide, General Odom, to check up on that and call him back. And General Odom called him back a few minutes later and said, I'm sorry, sir, it's actually 2,200 missiles. And Brzezinski said, well, I want you to check that. And Brzezinski lay in bed preparing to call President Carter to advise a retaliatory strike on the Soviet Union. And Brzezinski decided not to wake up his wife, who was asleep beside him, because he figured if Washington was about to be destroyed by a nuclear weapon, he wanted his wife to die in her sleep. The phone rang again. Uh, it was General Odom who said, very sorry, sir, it was a mistake. Uh, and in this case, the false alarm was caused by a single computer chip that had been improperly installed in a communications uh, computer. And we were very lucky that uh, you know, no retaliatory strike was ordered. Now, since you've been in Australia, there is an addendum to that story. And I'll get you quickly to tell it, because it's yeah. terrifying. Uh, I spoke in Melbourne the other night. And afterwards, uh, an American came over to me, said that he was a launch officer in a Titan II silo that night. And uh, he and his fellow officer were given the orders to remove their keys, put them into the control panel. And they both stood there, both officers, with their keys, awaiting the order to turn them. And once those keys were turned, a Titan II missile would have taken off, heading for the Soviet Union, and there's no calling them back. Now, some might say, well, look, that's all in the dark ages. Um, you know, we've got new technology now. We've got fail-safe mechanisms. The system's a hell of a lot safer. That's true, but only in part, isn't it? As long as there are fully assembled nuclear weapons, there will be the potential for catastrophe. A few years ago, 50 of our Minuteman missiles in the United States suddenly went offline, and they were offline for an hour. And what that meant was the officers could not communicate with their missiles, and there was some fear at the Air Force that someone had hacked into our command and control system. Is that, is that actually one of the biggest fears now? Because um, let's say the NSA, uh, which generates and holds the launch codes for nuclear weapons, has already been effectively penetrated by a private contractor, Ed Snowden, who got some of their biggest secrets. Um, that's happened once. Could it happen with nuclear launch There is no evidence that Snowden got the launch codes to our missiles, but the fact that a private contractor could get the sort of secrets that he did is extremely uh, disturbing. The former head of the United States Strategic Command in charge of all of our missiles and nuclear weapons uh, gave a speech a couple of months ago talking about how concerned he is about the potential of someone hacking into a nuclear command and control system either in the United States, in Russia, or in China. These are very, very dangerous machines. And like all machines, eventually they go wrong. Now, um, if this is all happening in the world's most advanced technological nuclear power, yeah. what's happening in Pakistan, which has the, the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world, but we know the problems of the political system in Pakistan? We don't know. Uh, we don't know uh, how Russia is handling its nuclear weapons. I'm very critical of my government in my book, but the United States has been much more open about its nuclear weapons systems than any other country in the world and much more open about its accidents and mistakes. I mean, it took me years through the Freedom of Information Act to get this information, but at least I was able to get it. It was uh, kept secret until then. It was kept secret. Uh, Hundreds of pages of incident reports which you acquired had all been kept secret. I found uh, more, you know, more than a thousand accidents and incidents involving nuclear weapons. And in many ways, it's a testament to the skill of our weapons designers that none of them detonated full scale. But I interviewed many of them for my book. And you know, they feel it's not a question of whether this is going to happen, but when. What's the biggest hair trigger uh, in the nuclear front, nuclear warfare front now? I mean, is it, is it India, Pakistan? Is it the possibility of terrorists getting a hold of nu a nuclear weapon or even a plutonium to create a dirty bomb? Or is it a state actor um, that we haven't really talked about? I think the two most con concerning things uh, are the rivalry between India and Pakistan. They're, they're neighbours. And the flight time of a missile is going to be five or six minutes. So if one of those countries thinks the other one's about to attack, there's not going to be the same kind of time available like Zbigny Brzezinski had to find out if it's a false alarm or a real attack. And you have two countries that have very intense hatred of one another, both armed with nuclear weapons. 
and the other is the possibility of a terrorist group getting hold of a nuclear weapon or making one. Um, I have a book coming out here soon called Gods of Metal, which is about a break-in at an American nuclear weapons facility that showed how easily terrorists uh, could break into one of these facilities and get the weapons-grade uranium to make their own bomb. Eric Schlosser, that's another interview. Uh, and uh, if there's any chance of doing what we will do, it. I have read that book, actually. It's remarkable and Thank very you. interesting. So you'll come back to us, hopefully. Thank you very much.